The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar today on HyPod Testing 101. Also, a good evening to all those joining us from Europe or other parts of the world. Um, the topic today is uh, HyPod Testing, and this is the first webinar for uh, you know, learning about HyPod testing, which we have learned a little bit in the past webinars, but this is this one is going to focus just on HyPod testing. Um, before we move on, I'm your host, I'm your presenter, um, Sayyad Abidi, one of the applications engineer here at Associate Research. Also joining us today is Vanessa, um, who's one of our um, business development specialist and she will be assisting you guys on the chat line um, for any questions that you may have on the material that's being presented so feel free to put all your questions on the chat line and Vanessa will be more than happy to assist um, and then uh, as always we have Brittany uh, organizing this webinar running the show here and uh, any questions uh, on the audio or video or even the presentation if you want a copy of it uh, you can forward those to Brittany. So a few quick notes before we dive into the main material. As always, we have our Q&A utility, uh, the chat line where you can ask all your questions and that's where Vanessa will be assisting you. A recording of this webinar will be available along with the presentation on our website, on our archive page, uh, you know, uh, in, a couple, in a matter of few days. And then uh, if you have, again, uh, any other connection issues or anything else, uh, you can email um, Brittany or you can ask questions on her uh, on the chat line as well. Email address brittany.soha at iconicsusa.com if you want to uh, obtain a copy of the webinar presentation. Okay, so I think we have uh, plenty of attendees uh, already joining. So this would be a good time to start looking at what we're learning today. Quick uh, look at what we're going to be going through today. Um, understanding the HyPod test, HyPod test requirements, HyPod test considerations, failures, and arc detection. Hopefully we'll have enough time to cover everything and leave a little bit room open towards the end for any questions that you may have. Okay, so the HyPod test is, uh, if you have been following us, uh, you know, this year for our webinar series, we've already talked about HyPod test in, a, you know, a couple of previous webinar presentations, um, but we did not go into a lot of detail. We just learned what the test is and, you know, what it's meant for. Today, we're going to learn about the HyPod test and get into more details, look at, you know, how it's done, what's really being tested and, uh, you know, um, more details about the test in general. So as we all know, the dielectric withstand uh, or voltage withstand test, which is also another name as the standards like to call it. And, uh, you know, again, the, if you look at the test standards that require HyPod testing, they may have different names for the HyPod test. Some may call it dielectric strength test. Some standards call it out as a flash test. Uh, dielectric voltage withstand test and you know maybe there are a few other names but they all basically mean the same thing which is the HyPod test short for high potential and it's one of the most commonly specified tests if you pull up any of the electrical safety test standards you will see that the HyPod test is more or less always required and um, you know um, there's other obviously uh, other electrical safety tests as well but this is the one that's always almost uh, you know um, available in all the standards. So the test is uh, designed to verify that the insulation of a product is uh, you know strong enough to withstand uh, high voltage for a given amount of time. So basically this is a test where the insulation of an electrical product or any insulation barrier for that matter is uh, stressed with high voltage and um, the condition of the uh, insulation is determined based on the results of the HyPod test, which uh, you know, which can be of many different types, and we're going to talk about those. You know, what type of failures can we see during a HyPod test? So, 
the test is performed by stressing the insulation of the product far, uh, you know, uh, with a high voltage far beyond what it would encounter during normal use. This means if you think about an electronic product which will be plugged into the wall outlet either in the US or, you know, in Europe, anywhere where the wall, you know, the normal um, voltage is uh, 120 volts or 240 volts. So that's the, the uh, you know, that's normal voltage that a device will always experience, uh, you know, and uh, there are times when the power in a location or a facility or even in a city is bad and there may be transients uh, in the power distribution, which means there may be, you know, some voltage may be spiking up from the normal nominal voltage of 120 or 240 and that voltage can actually be damaging to the device as well as it can uh, you know pose a shock hazard electrical safety hazard as well so the high pot test therefore determines you know um, whether the insulation will be able to withstand uh, application of high voltage a much higher voltage than what it would normally see for a given amount of time without breaking down and uh, we'll uh, we'll try and learn what breakdown really means but the term voltage withstand tests comes from the fact that it's a test to uh, see how long or you know what kind of voltage can an insulation withstand for a given amount of time without breaking down. So if you look at the picture at the very bottom of the slide, it's showing a basic circuit for uh, what goes on inside the product when it's uh, you know when it's being high pot tested. So if you look closely, there's I'm showing a little uh, signs of a you know or symbols of capacitor and resistor, and what I'm really showing is on the right side is a product under test, on the left side is a high pot tester, and uh, the result of a high pot test is uh, always measured in terms of leakage current in the you know it could be either in milliamps or microamps depending on you know what type of high pot test we're running it could be an ac high pot or dc high pot the resulting leakage current is what we measure in order to determine whether a product's insulation is uh, you know able to withstand the high voltage without breaking down and the resulting leakage current is also used to determine the quality of the insulation because first of all you know application of high voltage across any insulation barrier will result in some sort of leakage current that's going to try and flow through that insulation barrier and that's what the insulation is meant for is to prevent high amounts of current from flowing to parts of uh, the a device where it's not meant to flow so the resulting leakage current is uh, you know can be analyzed and looked at and uh, you know Based on that, the engineers can make a decision whether the insulation is adequate and it's going to uh, be, you know, it's going to serve its purpose in terms of protecting the user or protecting anybody, you know, coming in contact with that device. And it also gives us some other information about the device under test as well and some of the things that we learn. So, the reason I'm showing, um, you know, uh, if you look at this picture, the reason I'm showing uh, symbols of a capacitor and a resistor is because essentially when you perform a high pot test on any given device, you're, you can think of that device under test as a giant capacitor. Well, and the reason is because if you think about what a capacitor is, it's basically two conductors separated by an insulator or some sort of dielectric material and that's why the name dielectric with stand test comes in because uh, the dielectric is our insulation that we're testing you know in our products and um, when you perform a test you're basically um, you know a basic high pot test is performed between the mains and ground or mains and chassis for a class one product um, which means all the current carrying conductors which is your line or hot and neutral against ground or chassis so everything in uh, you know separating your current carrying conductors from the non current carrying conductors is the insulation which will be stressed with high voltage and uh, that that's going to give us a leakage current value which we can determine and see if that's uh, you know a safe uh, uh, value of current so the insulation is able to withstand the high voltage and does not break down or does not allow excess leakage current to flow on the surface of the product under test. So only a good quality insulation will allow 
small amounts of leakage current to flow, whereas poor quality insulation or insulation that's been damaged may allow, will probably allow higher amounts of leakage current to flow. And in some cases, the insulation may just break down. And uh, breakdown basically is a condition where the insulation allows uh, very high amounts of leakage current to flow as if it wasn't even there. So um, that's that's basically a bad condition for any product. And you know, if uh, if you perform a high pod test and you see a breakdown condition, that means the insulation is definitely in very bad shape and needs to be looked at. And obviously, good quality insul insulation will not allow. Um, higher uh, amounts of leakage current to flow across it or through it. So past condition for high pod tests, obviously we can set our high and low limits, you know, based on the product type, the industry we're in. And we'll, we'll talk more about uh, setting the high and low limits in the next webinar, which is high pod 102. But let's continue here and see uh, a fail condition for a high pod test. So again, a fail condition, the most obvious one for a high pod test is breakdown. Uh, you know, which results in excessive leakage to the chassis of the DOT. The other condition, uh, failed condition for a high pod test could be a short condition. A short here basically means one of the hot or neutral conductors or one of the conductors inside uh, an, any electronic product is shorting to the chassis of the product or in other words, to the ground of the product. Um, that means basically that's that's also a hazardous condition, right? Because you know if a current carrying conductor is shorting to the chassis, and the chassis is what you know comes in contact with with us, with, with operators and people who are using uh, you know, the product, that's uh, that's also a shock hazard. So a high pod test can also catch any shorting condition. And uh, so the other um, types of failure you can see during a high pod test are probably your high limit and the low limit. Again, those are the failure thresholds for the leakage current that we will, that the user will program into the high pod test. So the high pod test, like I said, is not just a test for, uh, you know, safety uh, of the end user. In fact, it does give engineers or designers of a uh, product a lot more good information which uh, you know a designer must know about their product so the high pod test can be you know is or i guess it's it's more or less required as a performance test or type test meaning you know when you're designing a product uh, during the engineering phase uh, you know in the in a lab environment a high pod test can is performed to uh, you know verify uh, the quality of the insulation and also uh, finding various important defects that may be present in a device. Um, defects such as nicked or crushed ins insulation, you know, stray wire strands or braided shielding, conductive or corrosive contaminants around the conductors. The, um, these are all the same factors that can lead to, uh, you know, a poor insulation quality. Uh, spacing problems and tolerance errors and cables you know if you don't space the conductors on a PCB for example uh, you know far enough or you know uh, at, a, at, at the appropriate distance there can be uh, you know uh, energy jumping from one conductor to the other uh, something like an arcing uh, which we'll talk about later in the in this webinar inadequate creepage and clearance distances introduced during the manufacturing process so as a type test you know the high pod test gives a good information to the designer about the overall quality of the product's insulation and any of the you know um, issues that we just talked about. But when performed as a production line test on fully assembled products, the high pod test is more of a safety test and it gives the information on whether you know the, there were no issues during the manufacturing process. Of, uh, of a device and uh, you know uh, there were no operator errors or any any other issues that can be caught by the high, by the high pod test so again going back to the production line high pod test used to determine whether the construction of a product uh, is about the same as the construction of the unit that was subjected to type testing because we already know as a designer we've passed the design or the type test our design of the product is approved now we're moving to production, but we still have to perform a high pod test to make sure that you know 
the production is good, you know, the quality is still being met uh, based on, you know, the design test results. And uh, in the end, most importantly, the product is safe for the end user because things can go wrong during production. And, you know, there are always, uh, you know, we've we've known that there, are, there could be issues during production such as operator error, machine error, or, you know, various other errors. And those are all the type of things that can be detected by a high pod test if it's being performed at the end of production line on fully assembled products. Um, so, yeah, so the high pod test in a production environment is more of a, just a go, no go test. And it's a, it's a, obviously the timings of the tests are shortened. And as we will look at some of the high pod test requirements per the test standards, you will see that the requirements of a type high pod tests versus the production line high pod tests are sort of different in the sense that the timings, you know, may be different. The, the, design test or the type test for, uh, you know, maybe a longer test, whereas a production line high pod test may be a shorter duration. So here's an example of the type of things uh, or issues and, uh, you know, defects that uh, the high pod test can also detect. And that's why we, you know, uh, high pod test is referred to as a versatile test because it's detecting quality, uh, defects, um, as well as safety of the device itself. And, uh, you know, insulation of all electronic products or insulation in general, um, you know, will degrade over time due to various factors, environmental factors, heat, uh, you know, moisture, contaminants, and uh, just the overall use of a product or a device will result in the degradation of insulation. It will wear over time and uh, it is always important to uh, obviously make sure before a product is being sold in the market, it uh, you know it is subjected to high pod tests to determine your your you know the quality of the insulation is solid. Um, a few more things about the high pod test. Uh, going back to the dielectric breakdown. Now remember we just talked about one of the failure types uh, in a high pod test is called a breakdown condition and that's what most standards actually call out is no breakdown of the insulation shall occur. So the best indication of a dielectric breakdown is a leakage current measurement significantly higher than the nominal leakage measurement, nom nominal leakage current measurement. Um, this means again, you know, when you perform a high pod test, uh, you know, the results being displayed in, uh, you know, um, the units of uh, electric current in amperes and most commonly in milli or microamps. The voltage um, used or, you know, set for the high pod test varies from standard to standard and depends also on the type of products. And also, you know, uh, we just, uh, the picture I showed you earlier, or the, uh, the circuit diagram I showed you earlier, is a, your basic high pod test, which we call, or which the standards refer to as mains to chassis high pod, meaning, you know, hot and neutral conductors uh, against your ground are being tested and everything, you know, separating those is the insulation. Um, there are other types of high pod tests as well. And um, going forward, I'll, give you guys some examples of different types of high pod tests basically because it's, it's all about you know dropping a voltage across an insulation barrier so some you know some more uh, complex electronic devices have other insulation barriers so those also sometimes are required to be tested uh, under you know with high voltage or high pod tested in general so the voltage uh, you know of the the test voltage uh, the product being tested and the capacitance of the overall product can impact the total leakage current measurement. If you obviously, if you test a device with a, you know with a high voltage um, that you've calculated for for that product, um, you know that should be that would that's the appropriate voltage. But if you test it for a voltage higher than what the insulation is rated for, you're most likely going to end up breaking the insulation down or failing the test because that insulation barrier is probably not meant to withstand, uh, you know, that voltage that you've programmed. Um, when we perform a high pod test on product, you know, um, obviously we've already covered this. It turns into like a giant capacitor and, uh, you know, um, 
proper charging and discharging uh, does play a important role in uh, especially in your DC high bot test which we'll cover more in our next webinar so a basic connection for a high bot test you know is just you know um, high voltage between your hot and neutral conductor and the chassis or the ground conductor and I'll show you a few examples going forward but let's talk a little bit more about the voltage uh, determining the voltage used for the high pot test because if you look at the test standards or the requirements you know um, sometimes they're kind of vague they give us uh, an you know a general criteria for calculating the test voltage being used now unless and otherwise stated or called out specifically by a safety standard a good rule of thumb for um, calculating the high pot test voltage is you basically take the nominal voltage of the device. For example, you know, if you're in the US, uh, we know the wall outlet uh, supplies 120 volts, uh, single phase. Uh, so we can, uh, you know, if we are to test a product that's rated for 120 volts at 60 Hertz, what we can do is simply uh, multiply the 120 by two. So twice the voltage rating, which is uh, 240 and add a thousand volts to it. So that gives us a 1240 volts or 1.24 kV. So that's just a rule of thumb if you're unsure about, you know, how to test. But again, it is, you must reference the test standard because that's, that's your base, you know, that's your main um, guidelines for performing uh, the, the high pot test and gives you all the requirements and gives you a good uh, basis for calculating the high pot test voltage and along with pass fail criteria. So in some cases safety agency requirements call out for high pot test for you know uh, certain devices for example uh, going back to my uh, you know um, uh, point about different types of high pot tests if you if you think of medical equipment there are um, you know there are connections in a medical device or points that actually make contact with a patient like and uh, you know we call those patient leads or applied parts and if you look at the 60601-1 medical standard the big medical standard um, that we run into very often um, there's a requirement in that standard um, for performing a high pot test at 4 kV or 4000 volts uh, for on applied parts and that's basically uh, a test where you apply a thousand uh, four thousand volts or 4 kV between applied part and ground or it could be between applied part and mains so now you can see how there's different installation barriers within a given product so you know your main in, you know your main high pot test is your uh, you know hot neutral shorted together high voltage uh, connected to the hot and neutral and then the return lead connected to the chassis or the ground of the product but then you have your applied part high pot test where you apply high voltage uh, you know where you stress the insulation barrier between the applied parts and your mains conductors which is hot and neutral or between applied part and ground so those are two different insulation barriers and the reason is because you know sometimes there's reinforced insulation between you know applied parts and ground or applied parts and uh, you know mains and that insulation needs to be tested but since it's reinforced it means it's capable of withstanding much higher voltage than what we calculated earlier for our basic high pot test which was 1240 volts in this case the standard asking us uh, is asking us to set a voltage of 4 kV which is a much higher voltage than the 1240 um, for uh, re reinforce or double insulation now then you have your class 2 products which don't have a grounded chassis or a ground uh, safety ground circuit um, most of the class 2 products you know um, they are the voltage levels obviously we can determine based on you know what we just learned and by reference in the standard and by using the rule of thumb um, but the return connection, you know, since there is no ground or true ground or, or chassis point, sometimes a piece of foil is wrapped around the, you know, the product's uh, surface or the chassis, and uh, you know, the the leakage current is measured at different points to kind of determine what's the, you know, what's the worst case, where at which point are we seeing the highest leakage current, and that's the one number that's uh, recorded in the test results. So um, again, you know. Um, the important point 
to learn out of this uh, material is that the high test parameters are called out by the test standards, but when in doubt, you can, rule, you can use the rule of thumb, which is twice the voltage rating plus 1,000 volts. So that leads us to our first poll question, which is uh, um, why are leakage current limits important during a high pod test? And Brittany will put up uh, uh, the poll question for you. Please take a moment to uh, you know participate in this poll, and we'll be back in probably a minute. Hey, Syed. So we had, the question was, why are leakage current limits important during a high pod test? Zero people said to ensure a product always passes the test. 50% of people said to comply with the test standards. 38% said to ensure a product is properly tested. And 12% said none of the above. Okay, thank you, Brittany. So, um, interesting, uh, you know, results from this poll question. Um, if you think about why are the leakage, uh, you know, current uh, or the current limits, which is your leakage uh, high and leakage low limits, important during a high pod test, it's mostly to ensure that you're testing the product correctly, and to a certain extent, so that you're complying with the test standard. Um, Leakage current limits help us determine, first of all, that we're performing the high pod test properly. Why? Because, you know, if you don't set, for example, a low limit, you know, and you run a high pod test and you, if you forget to connect one of the test leads, you may still pass the test, and but you really didn't test your device, which is why leakage current limits are important in uh, ensuring that the product was actually tested and uh, properly tested. So thanks again for participating in this poll. Interesting results, as uh, you know, as always, it gives us a really good idea of uh, you know um, whether what we need to uh, focus more on. So let's talk a little bit about class one and class two application. Now we know that there's obviously the electronic devices that are tested are either class one or class two. Um, meaning that class one uh, devices uh, that have a safety ground circuit and uh, you know are most commonly uh, have a have a line cord with three pins uh, one for hot one for neutral and one for ground and then you have your class two products which don't have a ground uh, you know safety ground circuit and they just have a simple line in neutral or hot and neutral so to test a class uh, class uh, one device what we can do is we can short the hot, you know, the hot and the neutral conductors on the line cord, uh, connect the high pot uh, tester output voltage to those uh, shorted hot and neutrals, and connect the return on the chassis of the product, finding uh, by you know by determining a good chassis point. Most likely, there's uh, you know there's always a grounding stud on most electronic products, or if not, there's always some kind of conductive. Uh, you know, grounded conductive screw or some other part that gives you a good, uh, you know, conductive connection, as shown in the picture. Um, for a class two application, um, as you can see in the image, we what we can do is, and I think I mentioned this earlier, um, most class two products, you know, um, sometimes they have a plastic, all plastic chassis. So you know, the best way to uh, get a create a, a conductive contact is by wrapping a piece of foil around the chassis of the product and connecting the return lead onto that foil so that it provides a conductive contact and you know when high voltage is applied and the product's insulation is stressed the leakage current flowing on the surface will be easily detectable 
if the conductive if the contact uh, for the return circuit was conductive or or some kind of metal and that's why we you know the standards you know a lot of test standards actually uh, you know allow and call out something like uh, using a piece of foil uh, wrapping it around the product's uh, chassis and uh, you know um, making a bunch of different leakage current measurements and recording the highest one because we always want to you know cover all our bases and make sure that we're recording the worst case scenarios like what's the worst leakage current which spot on the chassis is uh, exhibiting the highest leakage current value and we can record that um, another example of a you know um, a high part test uh, being conducted on a class one device uh, in the previous ones we were showing straight up test leads clips being connected a more safer way of performing a high part test is by using the adapter box or the receptacle box which uh, comes standard with the you know most high part testers whether uh, you know um, whether it's a you know all-in-one high part tester or just a standalone high part tester so uh, Obviously, uh, if the device has a line cord that can be plugged into the adapter box or the receptacle box, it is highly recommended that you do that instead of using exposed conductors and you know test leads. But the results, uh, you know, shouldn't vary much. They should still be the same, but uh, you know, um, depending on how you perform the high pad test. And uh, you know, another example of. Uh, you know how the high part test can be performed up uh, the 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 compliance analyzer shown in these images is the Omnia 2 I'm sure some of you are already familiar with the, the compliance analyzer that we're showing here and uh, you know there's many different ways you can perform the high part test you know different set of connections different set of leads depending on which other tests are being performed along with the high part test usually it's like a you know a, a series of tests which starts with if it's a class one product you start with the continuity or the ground bond and then you move into the high voltage testing uh, you know the high pods and the insulation resistance and then you move into your leakage current testing so um, you know really depending on the application you can use a bunch of different uh, configurations for uh, high pod testing so now let's start looking at the numbers or more importantly the requirements from the actual standards. So what we've done here at Associated Research is we've, uh, you know, uh, we've created uh, what we call a standard reference guide, where we've, uh, you know, we've worked through most of the common standards that we run into, or, or most of our customers, you know, are working with, and uh, we've summarized the main requirements from those standards into a sim much simplified form and in the form of a document, a simple document. And here's a, one of the you know, pages from that document from our reference standard reference guides. And we're looking at the requirements of UL or CSA, uh, UL 1598, which is I believe the standard for luminaries, uh, the LED industry, the lighting industry. And if you look at the dielectric voltage uh, withstand test requirements, um, uh, these are for the type test or the design test. And it's basically telling you test voltage equals 1,000 volts AC for incandescent luminaries. Uh, test voltage equals 1,000 uh, plus twice the rated voltage for all other luminaries. And test time is 60 seconds. So here it's giving us uh, a way of determining what type of voltage are we going to program in our high pot tester for this particular product and for how long do we need to perform the high pot test and if you look at it it's a 60 second test so that kind of if you're familiar with these numbers uh, or the requirements of the standard you can tell that a 60 second high pot test is most likely a design or type test and then for the pass or fail criteria the uh, the standard says no breakdown on product installation shall occur now that's kind of vague because that basically you know it's telling you as long as your product installation is not breaking down uh, you're passing the test you're complying with the standard but that's not usually the case because if you think about if you go back to one of our uh, earlier webinars um, on electrical safety testing I believe we shared a chart with you guys where we were showing um, you know different current values and the effect of those current values on human body so obviously the leakage current you know um, 
the, the criteria for setting the high and low limits is based off of those numbers. You know, you want to make sure that you are your product's installation is not allowing dangerous amounts of leakage current that can harm people. Um, so this no breakdown on uh, products installation shall occur, uh, you know, is uh, is just a guideline. You but you have you must determine a high and a low limit that you want to set to make sure that you know all your products are passing and failing consistently. In the sense that you know, all, if you're testing you know a, a product, a certain type of product, and you have like hundreds of different samples of the same type of product, as an engineer or designer, I would expect all of those products of the same type to exhibit same types of uh, you know um, you know, uh, characteristics when uh, exposed to high voltage meaning that the leakage current uh, uh, value that that will be measured uh, you know when those products are you know, subjected to high pot testing should be very close to each other so if for example if you're you know if you take 10 samples of a uh, same type of product and you perform high pot tests on those 10 samples you can calculate um, you know uh, an average leakage number and then you can use that average leakage for example if you get 2 milliamps of average leakage out of a you know, sample of 10 or 100 products that gives you an idea okay so my products of you know my this particular product series is uh, is uh, yielding two milliamps of leakage current then I can set my high leakage high limit and leakage low limit accordingly for example I can set my high limit as 2.5 milliamps low limit as 1.5 milliamps give it a 0.5 milliamp you know leeway so that you know anything that is outside of that range which is determined by your leakage low and leakage high limit will be considered a failure now it may not be a failure per the standard but from a quality uh, point of view you want to make sure all your products are um, you know um, yielding the same type of test results and that's that's why the high pot test is also a good quality check for the quality department so those were the requirements for um, uh, UL1598 for the type test uh, uh, you know testing portion now same test standard if you look at the factory production tests uh, the dielectric voltage withstand test is required uh, to be performed at a test voltage of 1200 volts uh, you know AC between primary circuit and accessible dead metal chassis again that's the same thing as hot and neutral shorted together and high volt uh, high voltage connected to those connections and return on the chassis or the ground but look at the test time here it's just one second that tells us that this is most likely a production test because in a, on a production in a production environment in a high especially in high volume production you know um, there's not in a much time you know you can't spend too much time on testing uh, high pi testing so a one second test is sufficient and uh, it's uh, you know globally accepted uh, which is why it's required by the test standards and again the you know the uh, the pass criteria is no insulation breakdown so again you can still use uh, those high limits and low limits that we just talked about and uh, set those accordingly and uh, again going back to my point that the high pot test can be a type test as well as a production line test and here's a perfect example of uh, you know out of a right out of a standard so a little bit more on standards if you look at the big IEC UL 60601-1 standard for uh, medical electrical equipment I'm sure most of you are familiar with those and have customers or are a medical manufacturer yourself um, if you look at the standard requirements it says um, you know test uh, voltage uh, should be um determined by multiplying the ac uh, uh, the 120 volts or the product's rated voltage times uh you know two plus a thousand and then again um you know a 10 second ramp up 60 second dwell and a 10 second ramp down that also tells us this is most likely a um type test because uh because of the times the long test times and again the pass criteria is no dielectric breakdown um uh, so what's important here to remember is that the production high pot test parameters 
may vary or differ from the type test parameters. And most commonly, it is the time, the overall test time that's different. The voltage may be the same. And you know, some of those applied part hypod tests or special hypod tests that we uh, talked about, you know, may not actually be required uh, during production or as a production line hypod test. You, you know, uh, standards, some standards do not require those tests, but just a basic hypod test from mains to chassis. Um, another example from the big appliance standard 60335-1, um, you know, the hypod electric, uh, again, look at the term that they're using here, electric strength test. So here's another one, another name for the same hypod test. And this is, again, the requirement for design test or type test. And this time it's calling for a 500 VA equipment required. This is another uh, topic uh, that falls under the HyPod test, which is a 500 VA HyPod, and we will cover um, you know, more details about the 500 VA HyPod testing applications in our next webinar, which is HyPod 102, HyPod testing 102. But for now, let's keep reading through these uh, um, requirements from the standard. Test voltage refers to a table, test voltage for zero, uh, class zero and class one appliances. It's just giving you a test voltage, and it's not, you know, um, it's not telling you to calculate it, it's just telling you to use 1250 volts AC. Test voltage for class two products, 1750 volts AC, because class two products, they have they don't have a ground safety ground, but uh, you know, they ha do have a reinforced insulation. So a more stronger insulation, which means a higher voltage. Test time, five seconds uh, ramp, 60 second dwell, again, uh, another um, you know, design hypod test requirement. And whereas in the same standard, if you look at read through Annex A, you'll see that the routine hypod test on the right side says uh, test voltage refers to a table, leakage current limit. Now, this is different, right? Instead of saying that no breakdown shall occur, it's actually telling you a limit. So it, basically that's your high limit. Five milliamps is what you can set for your high limit. And, uh, you know, leakage current for, um, you know, appliances that leak uh, high in general, the limit is uh, all the way up to 30 milliamps. So again, you know, all this information is basically telling us that, you know, the test standard that you, it is very important to first determine which standard you're working with and have a cop, obtain a copy of it and read through the standards and, uh, you know, understand for yourself what those requirements are, what do you really need to do, and then you can determine what's the best test equipment for your test application, and then you can go from there and uh, build your way up to basically, to, uh, you know, performing the HyPod test for your products. So next thing what we're going to show you is a quick video uh, of, uh, you know, a product being HyPod tested, and uh, I'll try and talk through the video and I'll probably pause it at times to make sure that you know you guys are getting what I'm trying to show here. So if you look at this video here, it's a medical device on the right side. Uh, um, you know, the return clip is uh, connected. This is the return clip uh, hooked onto the DUT uh, ground stud, and the line cord of the DUT is plugged into the receptacle box, which is connected back to the HyPod tester and the model of the HyPod tester shown here is the HyPod Ultra model 7850, uh, one of our newer HyPod test models. And uh, the test was performed at 1240 volts and the leakage current uh, measured, and it's a one second test, leakage current turned out to be 0 0.589 milliamps. I'm gonna pause it here because uh, let's talk about this a little bit. So, and the test passed, and the reason it passed is because we had a, you know, we had set a high limit which was not breached. In this case, for example, if I set a high limit of one milliamps, you know, this test passed because the leakage current measurement did not exceed that number. And, uh, you know, the connections, as you can see, I'm showing a safe uh, workstation inside in, uh, the product under test sitting inside enclosure. This, the next test that we're gonna run now is a failed HyPod test condition. And as you can see, I'm gonna pause here again. Uh, this time, the leakage current reading, uh, it's the same product, so it's the same leakage current reading at the same voltage, uh, but the test failed. And look at the failure message in red that says high limit. And that means, in this case, we probably set a high limit that was below this 0.589 milliamp number. 
So this basically is, uh, you know, uh, kind of going back to talking about how you you can set your high and low limits and, uh, you know, um, uh, set those parameters in the HiPy tester so that you can catch a pass and a fail properly. Okay, we're going to continue here with the video a little bit more. And... Uh, Another video we're going to show. Now here's a different application. The the product that I uh, you know showed earlier in the video was a proper electronic device, a medical device, a slightly complicated device. Um, here we just have a simple uh, heating element. So you know just another application for high pot test where um, the heating element's insulation is being stressed with high voltage. And again, the concept is the same. We're trying to the, you know, the manufacturer of this heating element is trying to determine how much leakage current does the insulation of this heating element allow to flow through it. So on the red clip is the high voltage uh, output from a high pot tester and the black clip on the far end uh, on the top is connected onto the chassis of the heating element. And um, it's sitting safely inside a plexiglass enclosure as a part of a safe workstation. And uh, next thing we're going to do is actually hit the test uh, button on the HiBot tester. And this time, again, in the in the previous one, the product was plugged into a receptacle box. This time, it's plugged into it's uh, you know we're just using test leads, and. If you watch here, the voltage has changed, you know, because obviously it's a different type of product, you know, so the voltage was based per that product and the test standard. It's, it's uh, 2,000 volts, and we have a high limit of 10 milliamps. So we're going to go ahead and hit the test button soon. Here we go. And... As we can see, the leakage current reading was 0 0.190 milliamps, and it's a pass. And that's a pass because, again, the high limit that I had programmed in this uh, test was not breached or not exceeded. So, just a you know a quick video demonstration of uh, you know what a high pod test, uh, how uh, you know products can be tested, different types of product can be tested uh, with high pod. So that was the video demonstration. And then that takes us into uh, another important topic, which is, uh, you know, which we covered a little bit earlier regarding the failure detectors. We talked about breakdown, leakage limits, and uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about is arc detection. But um, breakdown again is a, uh, is a very fast interrupt, you know, as you know, the moment you start the test and then the high pot tester, uh, you know, detects a breakdown condition, it shuts the output and displays a breakdown uh, fail message. Um, same thing for shorts. Uh, then you have your leakage limits, you know, um, which is your uh, basically the leakage current that's being measured as a result of the application of the high voltage. And uh, you know, those are uh, that's a slightly slower detector compared to the 400 microsecond interrupt. The leakage limits is uh, you know most of our at least associated research high pod test instruments. Um, are you know uh, their sampling rate is 100 milliseconds. So every 100 milliseconds, it's displaying or refreshing the uh, measurement on the screen of the instrument. And then we have the arc detection. So um, I know we haven't talked much about arc detection yet, but uh, you know arc detection is a is a phenomena which uh you know which was discovered you know when high pot testing was performed back in the days and it basically it's there as an added feature in, within the high pot test so it's not a test separate test on its own meaning that you know it's the we don't have a test that's called arc detection only it's basically a part of the high pot test when you program your high pot test parameters arc detection shows up as one of the features or parameters of the high pot test and uh, what arcing basically is, is, you know, high frequency noise or signals that are riding on the main output waveform. Uh, so those, you know, in, in some, uh, you know, in, in some cases, products being tested, uh, you know, they're just by their design, they, uh, you know, there's arcing going on when high pod test is performed on those devices. And some designers, engineers, 
manufacturers, they like to measure or at least determine whether their product is arcing or not. And um, some want to go a step further by determining what are the arcing levels, what levels of arcing is going on inside our product. So each failure detector has its own priority on the instruments. You know, the shorts and breakdowns will always be detected with the highest speed because that should be a really quick, uh, you know, uh, catch. Leakage current limits, we may take a little bit longer time to, you know, fully, you know, once the voltage is fully applied, then it starts making the leakage current measurements. And, uh, you know, it, that's it's based on the user-defined high and low limits for the leakage current. And our detection, again, is an extra added feature. And it basically gives uh, the users a good idea of the overall quality of the installation. Now, if arc detection fails within the high path test, it doesn't mean it's a high pod test failure because there's, you know, it's important to keep this distinction between uh, arcing, arc failure and high pod failure. Arc failure, you know, it's just basically telling you there's arcing going on at a certain level. That's not breakdown or shorting or, you know, um, um, you know, high or low limit failure. It's just that your product is arcing and it's giving you some idea that maybe the insulation is becoming weak and it gives uh, a lot of engineers use arc detection as an added feature to predict how the insulation is going to behave, uh, you know, moving forward uh, of a product. So here's another, uh, you know, a circuit or a, like a block diagram showing the failure detection of the high pod test, the arc, leakage, overload, you know, different speed samples. So everything is basically, you know, all these results are basically fed into the CPU uh, you know, the main main processing unit, which determines, uh, you know, which failure, uh, you know, to display and which failure is being detected. Um, going a little bit uh, further on the ARC detector. So, like I said, you know, if you look, follow this uh, diagram from the left side, you'll see I'm showing those little spikes on the main waveform. That's the noise. That's the high frequency noise. So, that's basically... Uh, so this is basically how the arc detection circuit works. That uh, that signal is passed through a high pass filter, which basically filters that high frequency noise, and it's fed into a comparator, and then it's basically compared with a user, uh, you know, um, uh, set value for the arc or user sensitivity level from one to nine, you know, and then uh, you know it's uh, those both those levels are compared and it's determined whether it's a arc failure or not and it's a fast detector you know again but again remember that arc detection is not required by any test standards which is why we have this as an added feature and it's an on off feature where you know if you don't want to use it you can simply turn it off and you know you don't have to worry about arcing uh, but if you are interested in learning about whether your product is going to arc or not um, this is a good feature to use. So here's a table, uh, you know, showing the different arc levels. As you can see, um, you know, nine being the most sensitive, uh, two milliamps, whereas one being the, you know, uh, the highest one at 20 milliamps. But it's important to rem remember that uh, the method of arc detection is not an exact science. Arc detection can vary, you know, uh, from place to place. So you know, it's not an exact science. There's many variables involved that can influence the results of arc detection, which is why, again, it's not required by any test standards and you're not required to, uh, you know, detect arcing conditions in your product um, per the test standards. So that takes us to our last poll question here. According to most test standards, which of the following is considered to be a true failure of the insulation? Now that we've talked about this stuff, uh, let's see what you guys uh, think. Hey, Syed. So 
According to most test standards, which of the following conditions is considered to be a true failure of the insulation? 90% of people said breakdown, 7% said high limit or low limit, 3% said arc failure, and 0% said GFI. Awesome, Brittany, thank you. Okay, well, uh, great. It's uh, good to know that most of you guys understand that breakdown is basically, as per the test standards, is considered a true failure of uh, you know the insulation or a true high part failure. But again, remember that it's always important to determine high and low limits for your tests, uh, you know, for your high part test to make sure all your products are, you know, uh, passing consistently or passing within the same range. So that basically uh, takes us toward the end of our webinar and I would like to leave a few or at least five minutes open for any uh, questions, and I'll, this is where I would like to ask uh, Vanessa, who's been helping you guys on the chat line, to speak out any questions that are maybe pending and or if she thinks those are good for everybody to listen on to. Vanessa, you might need to uh, unmute, yeah. Okay, hello everyone, um, Syed will, there wasn't really a lot of questions in today's webinars. You did a great job at presenting everything and covering all aspects of a high pot test. However, there is a question that came in a couple of minutes ago by our attendee, Philip. He is asking, in the heating element high pot demo, why was the tester's high potential only connected to one of the heating element terminals instead of both hot and neutral connections on the element? Sure, thanks, Vanessa. Um, great question, Philip. Um, the reason for that connection of uh, the high voltage output to only one of the uh, connectors is because there were many different, uh, you know, if you, if you, let's go back to that picture real quick. And if you see here, we were, what we were testing are different, uh, oh, I may have to go, hold on. I'm sorry, that was the video. Uh, Okay, just gonna pause here. So if you look, if you look closely here, um, you know there's many different, uh, you know, connections here. And what we're trying to do is we're testing the different insulation barriers. What we could have done is we could have shorted all these as well and performed a high pot test by shorting all these, uh, you know, um, hots and neutrals and test it against the uh, the outer insulation, uh, the outer conductor. Um, in this case, what we're doing is we're basically just testing one against the main, uh, the, the outer conductor. So again, there's no, uh, you know, it, it, all those tests, uh, e either you short all of them or test one at a time, they're all valid tests. So, but good question because, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm glad you noticed that. And, uh, you know, in some cases, we would simply short all the hots and neutrals together and measure against the main insulation uh, or uh, the outer core of uh, the heating, heating element. So um, going back to the webinar, um, again, if there are any other questions, you know, you can post them on the chat line. If not, I just want to go through a few more things. Uh, you know, you can always visit our website, which is arisafety.com, and uh, go into educational resources for, uh, you know, for our archive webinars, white papers, a lot of uh, good, you know, information, um, you know, um, educational material is available on our website. Our next webinar is HIPOT Test 102, which is where we will cover more about AC versus DC, 500 VA, more about you know failure detectors of the HIPOT test. It's on uh, Wednesday, June 6th at 10 a.m. Central U.S. time, and uh, you know um, we also have our uh, take a look at our consulting page um, if you need uh, you know if you have a need for training and consulting needs. And uh, in the end, I'd like to thank you all for taking out time to um, be with us. And you guys are the reason why we uh, have our webinar series going. And uh, you know, if you have any suggestions, any feedback on our webinars, any topics that you want to see us cover in the future, please do uh, you know uh, reach out to us. Uh, you can reach out to Brittany, and uh, she'll definitely uh, you know uh, pass on the information to us. Uh, again, you can contact us. Uh, um, uh, via the following email address and the website. And all these webinars will be available for um, review uh, on our archive page. 
So at this time, it seems like uh, there are no other questions, and um, this would be the right time to sign off. Again, I'm your host, Syed Abidi, live from uh, Lake Forest, Illinois, signing off. And uh, again, a big thank you for you know joining us today, and see you next time.